many of you ready for the word this morning? Yes, hallelujah. I've been ready to preach it since 9 o'clock last night. I almost was just going to come on the platform. As soon as I stepped on the platform, I was going to stop the music, tell everybody to come down, and I was going to preach. I'm going to do that one of these mornings. Because when the word's boiling up in you and you got a word, you, 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 you've been preparing, you've been saturating yourself, you've been praying, you've been seeking God. And when it's in there, it's kind of like a river. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a horse or a horse race, and they can't wait for the gate to fly open so you, can, so you can bolt out and you can let it go. How many of you know what I'm saying? See, the word of God is alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. I'm going to share with you on the theme for a few moments this morning. The gospel must be preached. I appreciate the preliminary. I appreciate what the team was bringing us in to recognize our salvation. The gospel must be preached. I said this gospel must be, not might be, not it's a good idea if someone likes to hear it, uh, not if it suits your fancy, uh, not if you, if, you have, if, if you have a little extra time, maybe uh, it, it needs to be preached. The gospel must be preached. Amen? I'm going to give you a few reasons why it must be preached. Go with me. I'm going to go quickly this morning. Uh, we, this gospel must be preached. This gospel must be preached because Jesus said to preach it. I said it must be preached because Jesus said to preach it. That's enough. We must do what he said to do. Amen. In fact, he said in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. You know what that means? That means the end won't come till the gospel's been preached to every nation. Till every person that got ears to ear uh, will hear the gospel. Jesus is not coming. The gospel message must be preached because he said preach it. Nothing's going to stop it. The gates of hell won't stop it. Fear won't stop it. The devil won't stop it. Uh, it's a divine mandate for us to preach the gospel. It's okay for you to say amen. I need it. Amen. Number two, the gospel must be preached because it is a condition of man that he's lost. I am so, uh, I am so surprised lately uh, with, uh, with the circumstances I hear, the different way people talk, the different way society is, the different way the media is, how little attention Jesus gets, how little attention God gets in the midst of all that's going on around us. We might not realize it, church, because sometimes we're in a cocoon. We're saved. It's, it's, we're, we're in our Christian circles. But we know the Christian lingo. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love you, brother. Glory to God. Let's have a hug. Mm -mm -mm. And, 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 you know, we have, our, we have our little Christianese. You know what I mean? And, and, and the world's out there, some, the world's out there lost and undone and don't know who Jesus is because the condition of man is lost. It says in Romans 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That merits an amen. amen. Hallelujah. Is anybody with me? You see, the condition of man is still lost. Uh, it doesn't matter how many years the gospel's been preached. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many television programs and television evangelists and 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 how many Bibles have been given away by this uh, country. We, we, the United States, is the gospel country of the world. We give away more Bibles, more literature, more tracts to the world than anybody else. But the world is still lost. Someone said there's only 52% of all the voters that vote, 52% are, are, are Christians. That means not even half. And then there's a bunch of, a bunch of them that don't even vote. And so guess what? That narrows it down to. That narrows it down uh, to, the, uh, to the disorganized uh, m m uh, minority takes over the, or, or the organized minority overthrows the disorganized majority. Is anybody with me? You see, we still live in a lost and dying world. Number three, this gospel must be preached because there is one true gospel and we must preach it. There's only one true gospel. It has nothing to do with Mormonism. It has nothing to do with Buddha. It has nothing to do with Muslims. It has nothing to do with any of the other religions. There's only one true gospel. There isn't all these avenues, and, and if we just take an avenue, pretty soon all the streams run together. That's not how it works. And Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
Ephesians chapter 4 said there's one body, one spirit, just as there was, uh, there was, we were called into one hope uh, of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who is above all and through all, and that's Jesus Christ. So we need to recognize, uh, church, that, uh, that there's only one true gospel. There's only one way to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. One day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not that Mohammed is Lord, not that Krishna is Lord, not that Sun Moon is Lord, but Jesus Christ is Lord. Can anybody say amen? amen? Stay with me this morning. I'm going to move quickly with you. I've covered these things last week, but I'm just recapping. Uh, the, another reason why this gospel must be preached because of the call of God on our lives. When you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, there was a calling that came upon you. Uh, there was a mandate that came upon you. Uh, there, was a, uh, there should be an unction within us. That's the reason why uh, we go to the homeless. That's the reason why we do the outreaches. That's the reason why we have services in here three times a week. And we, try, and we give an altar call every time we have a church service is because of the fact uh, we recognize uh, uh, that there's a calling of God on our life and we must proclaim it. Paul said, I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle in Romans 1 and 1 through 7, uh, pertaining to the gospel of God, which he promised before uh, through, his promise, through, through his promise in the Holy Scriptures. Paul said, this calling is heavy upon me. Church, this calling is heavy upon me Amen. to preach the gospel, Amen. to see the captive set free. On, on Thursday night, we're teaching the book of Mark, and we've been talking about how the main Focus, the main thing Jesus came to do. And Mark is, is, is real bottom line. He don't, we don't, he don't give a lot of extra time to things uh, that, uh, that doesn't just bring us right through. In fact, the key word is immediately. And he said immediately Jesus went to the cities and the villages preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then when the gospel was being preached, then the result of the gospel was healing all that was sick and afflicted and casting out devils. We don't hear a lot about casting out devils today. We talked about that Thursday night. Uh, you know, the churches are so modern today. Uh, we, don't wanna, uh, we don't want anything sloppy to go on in our church. We don't want any demon-possessed person to come in and start jerking and shaking and fall down and roll under the pew uh, like a snake, and then we got to cast the devil out of them. We don't want that in our modern churches because we're all dressed nice, you know, and we're all proper. Jesus wasn't afraid of that. He said, in the synagogue, in the synagogue, he cast out devils. Is anybody with me? You see, there's still a place that the gospel must be preached because, because it's so important and so powerful that people need to be set free. Number five, the gospel must be preached because, and I'm going to spend a little time on these now, is because of the Great Commission. Because of the Great Commission, Dr. Seymour hit on some good stuff this morning. And, 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 and if, you're missing, if you're missing the 915 devotional, you're missing something. Dr. Seymour ministered on some of the things uh, that it takes as a Bible college director and as a, a Bible college administrator and as the dean and students that come in. And it takes a certain amount of, of discipling and a certain amount of pouring yourself into somebody else to make change. It's just not I'm the dean. Come along, sign your name, uh, send me your checks, and we'll make sure that, uh, that you go through the program. That's not what we're interested in. We're into, uh, interested in making ministers and making able ministers uh, that can change people's lives because of the Great Commission. It says in, in, in Matthew 28, verse 17, when they saw him, in Matthew 28, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There's always some that are going to doubt. There's always going to be doubters. There's always going to be somebody that's going to say, I don't believe that. There's always going to be somebody say, I don't care about that. There's always somebody that's even going to go beyond that and make mock and make fun of who God is. Uh, but one day, the mockers are going to bend their knee and they're going to bow their knee to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. And Jesus said, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Did you hear me, church? All authority in heaven and on earth. 
All authority has been given to the Son of the living God. All authority has been given to Jesus, the Son of God, uh, the, 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 uh, the second part of the Godhead bodily, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost being three separate but also being one. Uh, all authority, Jesus said, been given unto me in heaven and in earth. So here's what he said to do. He said, go therefore. Every one of us is commissioned to go. Maybe it's go across the street to where your neighbor is. Maybe it's go across the counter in the workplace. And maybe it's to go to the next, uh, to, the, to the grocery store and, 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 and ask God to show you somebody uh, that you can speak life into. Uh, but he said, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things uh, that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the earth. Church, let me say this to you. Preaching from the pulpit. Preaching, I've been listening to Chuck Swindoll lately, and he hit on a few of these things. Anybody ever listen to Chuck Swindoll? Oh, he's good. He's good. He'll speak some powerful stuff. But preaching from the pulpit is just part of my responsibility. Well, man, all I want is a good pulpit preacher. There's a lot of churches, every, every two years, uh, they turn over preachers. And after a while, those preachers, all they got to do is preach all their sermons for two years, and then they go to a new church, go back to sermon one, start again. How many of you know that can make a preacher lazy? You see, we need to be seeking God for a fresh word. We need to be seeking God for an anointing. We need to be seeking God for the flow, Amen. Uh, my, my job isn't just to be a, be a pulpiteer. My job isn't just to get up and be able to, uh, be able to present. There's a lot better preachers than I am, and I know that. Uh, there's, a lot, there, there's preachers that will absolutely preach your socks off. Uh, there's preachers that will just mesmerize you. Uh, there's preachers that will get behind the pulpit, and when they start to preach, they put you on the end of your seat, and, and, and you're almost out of your body experience by the time they get done. And then after the service, you don't see them standing at the back door greeting the people, telling them they love and give them a hug, saying we care for you. They slip out in the, in the corridors and go up to their office and they run and they have their bodyguards all gathered. Right. After all, they're pulpiteers. They can preach. There's better preachers than me, but I'm going to tell you one thing, church. My job business doesn't stop by standing up here and preaching a sermon on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night. And my job goes beyond that uh, when, there's, uh, when there's a need for, uh, for brokenness and there's a death in the family and there's a baby that's born and there's a sick person in the hospital and there's surgery that's going on. And then there's somebody that needs to be mentored and discipled and put my arm around and say, listen, I want you to walk through life with me. It's not the things that are taught. It's the things that are caught in our life that makes a difference Did anybody hear me this morning I got some young men that I'm, 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 I want them to stay close to me and I might not tell them all the things that they need to know they can learn that in the Bible school I want them to catch some things through the power of the Holy Ghost the anointing will flow through me and into them and their lives will be changed Amen. are you trying to duplicate yourself in people pastor Jesus did Jesus tried to duplicate himself in 12, and he sent those 12 out to do exactly what he was doing. And he didn't sit around and say, I hope you guys don't get, any, don't get better than me. Every person that I've ever pulled alongside of me to mentor, I hope they turn out to be better pulpit preachers. I hope they turn out to, to be better ministers. I hope, they, uh, I hope they have a greater anointing. Elisha has said, Elijah said to Elisha, you'll have a double portion of what I have. And the double portion fell on him. And he did twice as much as what Elijah did. So get ready, get ready, get ready. The anointing, Mr. Howard's fall on you. A double portion, whatever I've done, twice as much is going to flow through you. Hallelujah. Is anybody with me this morning? You see, I'm a, I, it's, it's my responsibility to disciple people. It's my responsibility uh, to uh, prepare myself uh, and pour, pour myself into, into others uh, because I had someone pour something into me. I had a man. I had a man that was my pastor. That and I'm my pastor is Pastor Virgil Stone up in uh, up in Flat Rock, Alabama, and he's poured into me for 40 years. But I put myself under a pastor uh, that I that I that I was under his tutorage for 20 years, 
He did things that I couldn't understand why he was doing. He did things that I said, my goodness, it's not going to work like that. And when I learned what submission was, and I learned how to place myself under his authority. The anointing of God started to flow through me. And when I caught the vision of it, whenever I got in the flow of another person's vision, the time came that God released me for the vision he gave me. Is anybody hearing me this morning? How many disciples of Christ do we have? It says in Mark chapter 3 and verse 13 through 15, it says, it says Jesus, Jesus chose 12 disciples. Are you willing to be my disciple, he said. In fact, let's go over there. Now, let's go over to Mark. Let's take a look at that. The book of Mark is cooking and booking in me, so I have to get in here for a minute. Is that all right? Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. And he went up into the mountain. He called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. He chose some people that he wanted. He looked around and he found some people. They weren't necessarily uh, the richest people in Jerusalem. They weren't necessarily the most renowned. Uh, they weren't necessarily uh, had any particular thing except for Jesus saw something in these men that they would be willing to lay down everything and follow him to be a disciple. Uh, being a disciple isn't a part-time thing. Being a disciple isn't, well, once in a while if I got a little time. If I got a little extra time after I'm done with my job and done with my family and done with my vacation and after I'm done doing my extra, extra job to make extra money and after I'm done with all that, if I have a little time for Jesus, he, I'll be his disciples. No, you won't. You might think you will, but you won't be because it says, Then he appointed twelve uh, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. That didn't come by casual relationship. That didn't come by, well, let's meet once in a while and let's have a little Bible study. Let's get together for a prayer meeting once a month. That didn't come like that. Now, that came by laying down their nets. They were fishermen. And their dads were prosperous, was, had, a, had a prosperous fishing business. And they were hardworking men that worked with their hands. And they laid down the nets and they went to their dad and said, Dad, I would love to stay with you. We care about you. We love you. But Jesus said, follow him. Is anybody with me? And we have to have that kind of mindset. Turn me to the book of Luke. Luke 14, I'm going fast. I'm going fast this morning. I hope you got ears to listen fast. Are you with me still this morning? Luke 15 and verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, Now listen, get this picture. Jesus is, 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 is out in the outskirts. He's not in the city now. He's out there in the open land where multitudes can gather. And the multitudes turned to him. And he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brother and sister, yes, in his own life also, he can't be my disciple. That's tough, isn't it? He doesn't mean you have to hate your father. He doesn't mean be in rebellion to your parents. It doesn't mean don't do what mom and dad says to do. Because the scripture also says, honor your mother and father and you'll have a long life. What he's saying is, next to following him, next to making him number one in your life, uh, that ought to be a secondary relationship. Is anybody following me? You're not stalling on me, are you? You didn't panic on that, on that scripture, did you? I just want to make sure. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, Cannot be my disciple. Now the first thing he says. He said unless you put me first. Before mother, father, children, sister, brother. Uh, you can't be my disciple. And then he says after that. And whosoever does not bear his cross. And come after me. They can't be my disciple. It seems like being a disciple. A, a real disciple of Christ. Carries a pretty big load. Is anybody getting that? To really be a disciple, it looks like there's a price to pay. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ to preach the gospel in 1973. What is that? 30, 40 years ago? Is that 40, 45, whatever? How many? 41 years. Thank you, Allison. That was 41 years ago. 
And 41 years ago, when I surrendered to follow Jesus, in my heart, I said, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I want you to give my wife the understanding uh, to know that you've got a call of my life. Is she going to be able to bear up under the calling with me? Is my children going to be able to understand that there's going to be times that I'm going to have to minister to the flock? I'll have to be in a hospital in the middle of the night. I'll have to be with a family that's lost a loved one uh, for several days while my children maybe have uh, going to have to ha- have to adjust some of the things that we said we were going to do. Why? Because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ and I will follow him. Here's the, here's the off balance. There's been a lot of pastors that got so involved in following the Lord that they didn't give their children time and they didn't give their wife time and, and there was a strain on their marriage and their children are not coming to church today because uh, they, uh, they saw so much damage. How many of you know that's the downside? How many of you know there's a balance to this thing? I'm going to follow Christ. He's going to have my heart. I'm going to be after him. And at the same time, I'm going to bring my family along in such a way that they're going to love Jesus just like me. That's the reason why this, this beautiful, awesome lady at 42 years of marriage is sitting on this platform with me because she's got the calling of God on her life. She decided she would be a disciple of Jesus Christ. For which of you intended, listen, in verse 28, in which of you intended to build a, a tower? does not sit down first and count the cost. Who's going to go and build a, a house and not count the cost? Who's going to go and, and, and start a business and not count the cost? Who's going to go do something and, 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 and not consider what it costs, just haphazardly do it and then halfway not be able to finish and is sitting there in rubble and year after year people go by and they remember who started to build that and they say, look at that, they never could finish it because they didn't consider the cost. Am I right? Whether he has enough to finish it or not. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king uh, going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to put 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000, or else while the others is still in great way off, he sends a delegation and asks uh, and ask for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all, uh, that he cannot be my disciple. He gave us three scenarios. If we, don't, if we don't forsake, if we don't take up our cross, if we don't put him first, if we don't consider the cost, we can't be a disciple. And Jesus tells us in the Great Commission, make disciples. Pastor, you know what you're asking me to do? You're asking me to go win people to Jesus, ask them to come to the Lord, and then tell them the ultimate price they got to pay. You're asking me to tell them that Jesus has to come first in their life. That's what I'm asking. But that's not what I'm asking. That's what Jesus is asking. Go, therefore, make disciples. I just told you what Jesus said about making disciples. Amen? making disciples, and then baptizing them, and then teach them, that's discipleship, teach them, instruct them, and teach them the word of God in such a way that we can walk victoriously with the Lord and victoriously with our family, and we can know that Jesus has everything under control, and we can be victorious Christians. That's the reason why this gospel got to be preached. This gospel must be preached because... We must be witnesses in the Holy Ghost because we have the power. Do you know you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit? I hope everybody here is filled with the Holy Ghost. We preached on it enough times. We've had altar calls. Please come and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be empowered by the Holy Ghost. Well, I thought I got the baptism when I got saved. No, you didn't. You got the Holy Spirit when you got saved. No man comes unless the Spirit draws. In John 20, the disciples were saved. It said Jesus breathed into them the breath of life. They were saved. They were born again. 
And then in Acts 1, he tells the same disciples that was born again over in John 20, said, tear in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes upon you, until you've been empowered, until you've been endued with, until you've been overshadowed with, until you've been filled with the Holy Spirit because you got saved to go to heaven, but you need to be filled with spirit to live victorious here in, in this world. The reason why the gospel must be preached because people need to know there is an empowerment. There's a Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost empowerment that, that, that will flow through us like a mighty river if we'll just let him. Jesus, before he ascended, he said, but here, tarry here in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea, and the other most parts of the world. Don't even go out and start your ministry without the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Don't even go out and preach until you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't even go out and start to do anything until you spend some time in his presence and the glory of God fills you and his power starts to flow through you. And then you'll be empowered to do whatever he wants you to do. That's the reason why this gospel needs to be preached. There's a lot of churches today that used to preach the power of the Holy Spirit and used to have people laid out all over the floor when the, when the glory would fall and come through and the power of God. Uh, but, you know, it'll mess up in their program if they talk too much about it. It might mess up, uh, it might mess up the appointment at Smoky Bones. Let the other ones go first, and pretty soon it'll be empty, and then we can go after the, after the early crowd and after the Holy Ghost is done and after the power of God moves, and we'll still be able to get a good rib. Amen? Amen. I'd rather be in the presence of God and, 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 and eat, eat an egg sandwich and know that I've been in his presence and know I've been in the flow of God. Hallelujah. We must be a witness of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why the gospel must be preached. Number seven, this gospel must be preached because time's running out. Church, you didn't hear me. Time's running out. There's too many people that believe, well, you know, I'm, I'm young. and That's good for you, Pastor. You're over 70 years old. My goodness, it's about time you start getting serious about God. I mean, you know, you're almost over the top of the mountain. But I'm down here. I'm just still down here at the foot of the mountain, Pastor. I got a long way to go, you know. I got my, I got my wild oats to sow, and, and I, I got things to do and people to see and places to go. And, 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 and when I get older, then I'll do that. You're kind of like that, you're kind of like that snail that was, uh, that was crawling up the apple tree. You all know about that snail, don't you? Crawling up the apple tree. And this bird came, and the bird flew in, and, 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 he, and he perched on a branch, and, and he said to the old snail, he said, Mr. Snail, don't waste all your time climbing up that tree. There's no apples up there yet. The snail said, there will be by the time I get there. That's the, way a lot of, that's the way a lot of believers are. Well, it don't matter as long as I'm crawling up the tree of life. Uh, you know, I, one of these days when I get up there, I'll, I'll get the glory. I'll get the apple. I'll get the presence of God. I'll have time for that. But right now, I don't have time. Listen, time is short. Nobody has any guarantees. There's no promises. Some man that they never thought would have hurt anybody and had a good reputation and didn't have any particular problem uh, went to the university up in, uh, up in Tallahassee who uh, walked in there and pulled out a gun and shot three people that's how short our life is we don't have any guarantees time is short time's running out Jesus is coming soon Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 in those days John the Baptist came preaching John the Baptist was a preacher John the Baptist prepared 30 years to preach a little short message uh, that cost him his life it was a short-lived ministry. And Jesus said of all the prophets, John the Baptist was the greatest. Jesus said that. And John the Baptist was out in the backside of the desert preparing for 30 years to step on the edge of the Jordan River, the same place that Elijah caught, was caught up in the chariot, same place that the mantle fell on Elisha, that same place. And now John the Baptist is preaching the gospel message. And here's what he said. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, time is short. It's time. And even now the axe 
Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Indeed baptize you. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I am not even worthy to carry or to latch its to unloose. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. Church let me tell you time is short. It's not time to play around. It's not time to say, oh, hum. It's not time to sit and spend our time having a fireside chat. It's time to get combat boots on. It's time to get out there and, 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 and do warfare against the enemy. The devil's coming in like a, like a, a flood and, 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 and putting people in a stupor in these days and they don't realize what's going on. And, 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 and the world is passing us by when the gospel needs to be preached. This gospel shall be preached because the field's white under harvest. I said this gospel needs to be preached because the field. What's the field? I don't have any field, Pastor. I'm in a city. I'm not a farmer. I don't have a field. Not talking about, it's not, not talking about a farmer's field. Most of you should like country music if you're going to go to heaven. Jesus was country. I want you to know that. <laughs> Jesus was a country boy through and through. He lived in a little city outside the big city. He knew all about farming. He said, when you put your hand to the plow, don't turn back. He walked through the grain fields and picked wheat on the Sabbath day and, and fed his disciples and, 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 and was ostracized for it. Am I right? He talked about planting seed. He said, he said the farmer comes and plants seed. Some seed fell on good ground. Some seed fell on rocky ground. Some seed sprung up for just a, just a little while, but the sun came and burnt the seed out. Jesus knew all about farming. He knew all about the country life. That's just a little sideline. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, it says, Then he said to the disciples, The harvest truly. The harvest truly. In other words, this is a true thing. This is nothing to play around with. We're not kidding. This isn't, this isn't a little Bible story. This isn't a little enticing thing to make everybody feel bad so they can all run to the altar. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, he was saying the harvest truly is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. In other words, the Spirit of God has already, already went out through the world preparing the hearts of people. And, and they're ready, but now it's the job of the preachers. It's the job of the ministers. It's the gospel message that has to be preached to them. And he said, but the laborers are few. I find that today. The things that we need to do, it's the same people that do it. The work that needs to be done, it's the same workers that do it. And the people that give in tithes, it's the same people that give. Do you know that 20% of the people in churches uh, support the church and the other, uh, the, the, the other 80% are, uh, they want to ride the train and not lay any track? Anybody hearing me? Jesus said that the field is white into harvest. And, he, and the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray, Lord God, we pray. The Lord of the harvest to send harvesters. Well, who's a harvester? Somebody uh, that the glory of God has been placed in them and the Holy Spirit has overshadowed them and, and, and they've decided to be a disciple of Christ and pay the price and do whatever he wants them to do to bring in the harvest. So they can hear one day, well done, thy just and faithful servant. If this was then, 2,000 years ago, the field was white unto harvest 2,000 years ago. And Jesus said the labors are few, but the, but, 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 the, but the world's ready for the picking. How much more today? When the gospel's been preached when there's gospel messages on every television, if you want to hunt around and find it, the radio stations, there's a gospel flowing. Uh, there's short band radio that the gospel's going out through the airways. Uh, there's satellite radio. The gospel is being proclaimed. And the workers are still few. The field is plentiful. The, 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 the field's white. The harvest is, uh, the, the word of God has gone out. You know what harvest time is? Harvest time is when the farmers go out and bring in the crops when they're ripe. But if you wait too long, they rot in the field. 
My mom used to farm a half an acre by herself by hand with an old hand harrow that you pushed by hand, no tractors or nothing, half an acre herself. She, grew, she raised the best tomatoes that you ever, ever tasted in your life, except for the ones you bring, Mike. I want them to keep coming. That's the reason I said that. <laughs> and I want you to know something. Whenever the frost came, we better get out there before the frost and pick all the tomatoes and the green ones. And then we would have fried green tomatoes. Anybody ever had any fried green tomatoes? My mama would fix those fried green tomatoes. It'll knock your socks off. But you know what? If you leave them in the field, they're going to rot. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Anybody get anything out of this this morning? Is anybody challenged this morning to be a true disciple, to be a harvester? Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Maybe you're here this morning you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Listen, it seems like God has put me in the paths of so many people that don't know the Lord. He's put a heavy burden in me to, to preach the gospel. I don't want one person. I'm like, God, I don't want one person to go to hell. God said, I would that none would perish. No, not one. His desire is to see everybody. And the only reason why everybody's not going to be saved is because they reject the greatest gift they've ever had. Don't do it today. If you have not asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, if you can't remember a time when you put your hand in an nail scarred hand of Jesus, please, 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 I implore you, I beg of you, let this pastor pray for you. Let God do the rest. Or maybe you're here and you used to serve God, used to be excited. Church was your life. You spent more time in the house of God than you did in your own house. Something happened. Somehow or another, you got derailed and you got wounded. and Something upset you, maybe the cares of the world and circumstances, which, like I said, nobody knows. Nobody knows what you've been through. They might see your glory, but they don't know what you've been through. Maybe it's time for you to come and say, Pastor, I'm ready to come back, get in the trenches again, be a disciple of Christ, get back in the field. Do the work of the Lord today. Make a fresh commitment to Him. Because God's going to raise up an army. He's going to raise up an army that's not going to quit. It's going to, we're going to go marching through the land. And we're going to tear down the strongholds of the devil. The power of God's going to be manifested. If you're here and you need prayer for either one of those, you need to come back to the Lord and come back and, and, and make a fresh commitment to Him. Or you need to be born again. You need to give your heart to the Lord. Will you raise your hand right now? Say, that's me, Pastor. I see that hand. God bless you. Is there somebody else? Somebody else, raise your hand. Say, that's me. I want to get some things right. I want to get some things right. I see your hand, sir. Anybody else? By the uplifted hand, say, that's me. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand, dear. God bless you. Somebody else. Say, Pastor, I'm making a decision to be one of them disciples that's willing to pay the price. See, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. That's how the kingdom of God is, all or nothing. Is anybody else by the uplifted hand say, that's me, Pastor. Include me in this prayer. Stand with me. if you. God bless you, dear. I see you back there. Stand with me, if you will, everybody in the house. If you were going to raise your hand and I didn't see it, the Lord saw it. Amen. The Lord saw it. I'm going to ask the elders to come to the altar. We're closing this service in just a few moments. I'm going to ask those who just raised your hand and said, Pastor, I'm going to make a fresh decision for the Lord today. I want you to step out of the aisle and meet me right here. Don't worry about anybody else. Ask somebody next to you say, excuse me, please. This congregation loves to see people saved just like I do, and they'll be thrilled to have you come. Meet me right here, right here. Come right down here and be with me. You raised your hand. God bless you. God bless you, dear. Appreciate you. Just come right down here. You're making a decision for the Lord, right? He's going to change your life. You won't ever be the same. 
anybody else going to be part of this? God bless you, dear. Come right down here and stand next to me. Appreciate you, sister. God's going to change your life today forever. Amen. You believe that? I do too. Anybody else? You want to be part of this group that's down here? I'm going to ask you girls to pray this prayer with me, okay? And pray every word. It's important. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray with them. And we're going to ask the power of God just to enter into you like never before. Say, Father, I thank you for touching me this morning. I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Make me whole. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. And I acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. And Lord, according to your word, I belong to you. I'm saved. I'm your child. Give me the power to live for you every day. From this day forward, I'm going to take up my cross. And I'm going to follow you. And I will be your disciple. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you for my sisters. I pray, Father, for the power of the Holy Spirit to empower this wonderful child of God. Lord, your daughter, empower her and strengthen her. Walk her through every day. Lord God, guide and direct her path and fill her with the Holy Spirit. Baptize her in the Holy Ghost and empower. Lord, baptize my sister in the Holy Ghost and power and the anointing. And God, that she'll never be the same after today. Her life will change forever. Touch my precious sister, Lord, and fill her with the spirit of the living God. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Baptize her in the Holy Ghost with power, with the anointing. Use her mightily beyond what she can even imagine or think. And fill her with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the three of you to go with this couple right here. Y'all go with them too, okay? Just go with this couple. They're going to put a Bible in your hand and minister to you. Is that good? Three souls give the heart to the Lord, made a difference in their life. Praise God. Every angel in heaven is rejoicing. The corridors of heaven right now are so excited, so much cheering, loud going on, you probably can't even hear yourself think. It ought to get a little noisy in here for just a second. What do you think? If you need prayer, if you have a need, you need a healing in your body. You need a healing in your body. Come, we're going to pray for you. This service will be over in about a minute or two, so stay with us, please. This is God's time to move. We appreciate it so much. If you need ministry, if you need a touch from God, would you come? Somebody will be here to pray for you. This is the time the Spirit of God will figure about your heart. Deal with some of the things. See you through some of the struggles that we all have. Sing this with me. Minister to him for a minute. I'm hungry for you. I seek your touch. I seek your face. Need your presence. Will you sing it with me one more time? I'm hungry for you. Listen to me, church. Six o'clock tonight. The anointing of God is going to fill this place. Mr. Howard's got a word. He's going to minister to us. This young man is a man that's got the word of God inside of him. And I'm going to encourage you to set aside any schedule this evening at six and come and honor God as the man of God comes and speaks to us and see if you won't be glad that you did. When the how it was it was it was Jesus' custom that when the church was the doors were open, he was there because it was his custom. 
It ought to be our custom if we're a disciple of Christ. We want to be in his presence. Can I hear an amen? Thank you, Lord. Would y'all reach out towards these that are that's this altar? Just reach out. If you believe God answers prayer, if you be if you believe God, God hears your prayer, then reach out for these folks and pray for them. Lord, in Jesus' name, let your anointing touch those. Pastor George, that he had the vision to start this wonderful ministry. We love you, Jesus. We praise you for the service this morning, the word that went forth. We pray you keep your hand upon us as we go our separate ways. It brings us back tonight. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray.